Hey everybody and welcome back to Sweatpants BI. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit devastated coming into this video. Unfortunately, the United States just lost to Netherlands about an hour and a half ago uh, prior to me recording this video. So unfortunately, my team is out of the World Cup. So before we get started on this video, I'm just going to do one thing real quickly. I'm going to go ahead and reveal the team that I'm going to be pulling for uh, moving forward. I've got my Croatia red and white checkers on. Hopefully we can get a second round going against France at some point, or get, maybe get some revenge. But regardless, I wanted to spend this video talking about my recent entry to the Maven Analytics World Cup Challenge. Obviously, I was pulling for the United States of America and, you know, Despite all of our efforts, they failed to pull it off in Cutter 2022. So, you know, maybe next time, maybe 20, 40, 80 years down the road, however long it takes, the road to a World Cup is not an easy one, as any football fan knows. Uh, you know, this only happens four years ago, and unfortunately, it's full of a lot of heartbreak. Um, but I'm going to be supporting Croatia moving forward. Maybe they won't let me down. But regardless, um, I'm really, really grateful to everyone who's already been weighing in with tons of uh, great feedback and kudos uh, on my Maven Analytics uh, World Cup Challenge submission. Thank you so much for all of, the, all of the praise. It really, really does mean a lot to me. If you are also entering uh, the World Cup Challenge or if your team is still in the World Cup, best of luck to you. But I did want to go ahead and submit a video for my YouTube channel, kind of walking through how I designed the tool, uh, how I built my layout, what were some of the things that I was thinking about, what sort of data visuals that I think might be interesting to include, what were were there any things that uh, or any steps that I took to sort of transform the data for this challenge to make it a little bit easier to work with. Uh, obviously, for these challenges, just because a company like Maven gives you a bunch of tables doesn't mean you have to use all of them. And it also doesn't mean that you can't bring your own data to the party if you have it available. So I did uh, take some liberties with the data sets that were provided to make it a little bit easier for this challenge. That's actually where I'm going to start in Power BI. So let's go ahead and hop over to the tool. So the first place that I want to start is in the Power Query Editor because I actually want to go through the Maven tables and sort of talk about how I set up the data for my uh, Maven World Cup submission. Because, you know, Maven gave us a lot of tables for this challenge, but in terms of actually using the data that was provided to try to predict how well I thought the United States was actually going to do in this World Cup, some of the information I found a little bit more useful than others. And I also found that I really needed to restructure this data in order to pull off the report idea that I had in mind. So if we start going through the Maven tables and just kind of looking at what we've got here, the first table just shows us all of the qualifying teams for the Cutter 2022 World Cup, the different groups, and the FIFA rankings. And so I started thinking, okay, this is potentially useful because uh, fundamentally, you know, we're only interested in understanding which teams the United States could end up facing. And uh, I thought that the FIFA ranking was a fairly good indicator of which teams are strong going into the Qatar uh, 2022 World Cup and uh, which teams are probably not going to be major contenders for this particular World Cup. I have another table here that just kind of lays out all of the matches that are coming up. This is useful context for sort of understanding the uh, structure of the of the tournament, but I didn't find it to be very very useful um, in in sort of predicting you know where the United States uh, could go in this World Cup, other than sort of understanding obviously the teams that they're going to face in the group stage, and understanding uh, potentially who they might end up facing in the round of sixteen, maybe the quarterfinals. You know, I, I figured that any World Cup. Uh, there's going to be enough surprises and upsets that it was fairly pointless, in my opinion, to try to predict the semifinals or the final. Uh, even though I did feel like looking at the groups and the potential face-offs, that it was a pretty good likelihood that if the, if the United States were to advance, that they were going to face off against the Netherlands and Senegal. And so that is, or Senegal, and so that's something that you're going to see called out in my report. Uh, in terms of the data dictionary, again, just really, really useful context, especially if you're someone who doesn't follow uh, soccer or football the way that I do. Uh, and maybe if you're a little bit less familiar with the World Cup and just in interested in sort of sinking your teeth into some uh, World Cup data, 
I'm sure that this was a little bit more useful. I'll be honest, this is the first time that I think I'm really looking at it. Um, and then the international matches table, I thought was extremely useful for some sort of uh, understanding, obviously like the history of major international matches. You can see that they even go all the way back to the 19th century. Uh, and for understanding over time, you know, who the United States is facing uh, and how they've been kind of doing over, over time. So I'm going to be revisiting this table in just a moment. This is the table that I used for most of my World Cup analysis since, uh, since it has, you know, a history of each team and who they were playing against, uh, the goals that were scored, and also sort of the context in which that game was played, whether it was a friendly or whether it was a part of a major international tournament. And then there was also a uh, World Cup history table that was extremely similar in structure uh, to the international matches table and that it has, you know, the dates of the game, uh, who the home team was, who the away team was, the goals that were scored. Obviously, this is very, very useful information for me. And again, we have some World Cup history uh, that you know, is great background, a uh, very useful context for sort of the history of the World Cup, but not extremely applicable to this World Cup. Um, I, at the time that I'm recording this video, uh, teams like Germany were just eliminated from this World Cup. So you can uh, definitely understand that, you know, recent uh, World Cup performance is not necessarily an indication that a team is going to do extremely well in this World Cup even though, you know, it does kind of call out teams like France, Germany, Italy, Argentina, Netherlands, Brazil, teams that in any given World Cup, you know, based on history, you would expect them to do fairly well or to uh, advance more, oft more often than not to some of the later stages. So useful context, but as far as actually uh, factoring into my report on uh, the United States' chances of succeeding in this World Cup, I kind of just glanced at this table, but didn't end up using a whole lot from it in my tool. And then, of course, World Cup winners. Uh, really a very, very uh, similar table to what is set up here. Um, but just kind of breaking down, you know, the different um, uh, teams, when, which tournament they played in, whether they won second, third, fourth, etc. You know, this is a table that I actually built myself based on the World Cups table and just kind of pivoting it around. So now let's uh, go ahead and go to some of the other tables that I created on my own. Because let's return to this international matches table. And one thing that I found kind of frustrating about the setup of this table is that based on the given match that you're looking at, let's say you're interested in evaluating the United States. Well, the United States could appear in the home team column or they could appear in the away team column. So if you're trying to look at a comprehensive uh, you know, uh, perspective of how the United States is doing, you had to kind of keep tabs across two different columns, which I found to be a little bit clumsy to use. And it was the same thing in the World Cup matches table, where based on the given item that you're looking at, uh, the United States could be in the home team column or they could be in the away team column. So what I decided to do was just to uh, create reference tables from international matches and World Cup matches. And all I did was I basically, in the first table, just kind of left things alone. You know, if the United States is in the home team column, that's fine. Home goals, fine. However, in the away team version of the table, what I did was I swapped the away team and home team columns. Like I literally just dragged the away team column that also contains instances of the United States playing, dragged them over here, and then I just swapped the names. I named the away team column home team and the uh, home team column away team. And of course I did the same thing for the goals. Then I did the exact same thing to the World Cup matches tables where I have the you know home team and then I swapped the away team what I'm trying to do, if you're not following my logic here, is I'm trying to end up with a comprehensive uh, table that contains all of the matches that have been played internationally and in the World Cup. And I'm trying to create a, a, create a view where the United States is always in the home team column so that I can always have one column to filter on where I'm going to be able to see all of the United States' games and be able to reference 
you know, who they were playing at that time. Now, technically, this is going to create duplicates of every single match in the data set, but I'm fine with that by the way that I'm doing my analysis, because this way I can always, if I'm interested in focusing on the United States, I'll always be able to find them in the home team column and see who they were playing in the away team column. And then if I were interested in finding all of Canada's games or all of England's games, they're also going to be the team that I would then select in the home team column. So this way I've got a just comprehensive uh, table that will allow me to quickly reference all of the United States' games without having to worry about whether or not the U.S. is in the home team or away team column. It just made it a much easier way of working with all of this data. You can see that, you know, I just took these tables that I created I just appended them all together. And then I also, you know, did a couple of merges so that I could get some other attributes from the data into this uh, column or into this table. I created my own column that let me lets me know kind of which continent um, different teams are in um, and which continent the uh, it belongs to the uh, team that they're playing against. And then I also went ahead and just brought over uh, the FIFA rankings from the um, World Cup group table so that I could also do some comparisons uh, later on in the data because I thought that it would probably be pretty interesting for me to, you know, track historically how the United States has fared against teams who actually made the Qatar 2022 tournament. Obviously, for a uh, World Cup data challenge, if uh, they've played a whole bunch of teams that didn't qualify for Cutter 2022, I considered those matches to not be terribly relevant. Although, of course, it was uh, very useful to kind of track how the United States has maybe performed in the last few years leading up to the World Cup. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen in some of the early entries into the Maven Analytics Challenge, some people uh, doing comparisons about, you know, whether or not the uh, you know their the team that they selected how they did in home games versus away games but i didn't find that to be terribly useful in the context of the world cup because you know by definition only the host country of the world cup is really a home team the distinction between home and away in the world cup is uh sort of meaningless because all of the teams there except for the host country are obviously playing you know in a uh in, uh, on foreign soil or uh, not in their own stadiums. So, you know, that was just another reason why the whole home and away distinction was honestly more confusing than anything else for this particular challenge. And I just eliminated that entirely from uh, my version of the data. Um, I also, you know, while it's nice to have all of this historical data, for my intents and, pur and, and purposes in my report, I tended just to focus on... Uh, you know, more recent World Cup history, you know, maybe how uh, the team that I chose, the United States, has performed in their last, you know, let's say three to five World Cups. You know, that might give me an understanding of how the United States typically does uh, in World Cups going into this tournament. But anything beyond that, uh, eventually I just started to kind of consider, consider older games irrelevant in terms of what they could really tell us about Qatar 2022. And then I also, um, you know, tended to, to focus more heavily on how the United States has been performing uh, in international competition, maybe just in the last couple of years. Obviously, international teams um, change uh, their roster and their players all the time. So, you know, uh, tracking games or uh, measuring performance in games 10 years ago it was maybe not the best indicator of how the United States is going to perform in uh, Qatar 2022. If you look at the United States' uh, most well-known player, Christian Pulisic, was probably not even a thing to me, or, or not even a name that I knew uh, only you know four or five years ago. So going back too far back in time was probably not going to tell me all that much. At the end of the day, I tend to, tended to focus on how the United States has performed in recent World Cups and how they've been playing you know recently uh, to kind of tell me what I thought their chances were going to be. I wish that in this data set I maybe had some information around player attributes, you know, which players are scoring most, how healthy are they, uh, how many shots on goal are opponents getting, you know, maybe a little bit more information to tell me um, whether or not the uh, U.S.'s offense is struggling right now or their defense. Since I didn't have a lot of that player level data, I had to just kind of use the data available and extrapolate some of this stuff on my own. But hey, not a big deal. It's just a competition. We're all just trying to have fun with this. So I did the best that I could, but I definitely wanted to disclose that I took, 
you know, some liberties with the data that was provided so that I could, you know, tell the sort of story that I had in mind a little bit more easily. And so once we go out of the Power Query editor, I'll go ahead and start walking through some of the visuals that I did include in the report. By and large, since all the information that I had was focused primarily on, you know, specific matches that the United States played and whether they won, lost, or draw, and, you know, how many goals they scored relative to their opponents. Some of the uh, primary measures that I focused on for this was the United States' win rate and goal, di goal differential. Meaning, you know, in the last, uh, let's say, you know, two to five years, you know, has the United States been consistently outscoring their opponents? Have they been consistently winning games? Have they been giving up a lot of goals? Um, and ultimately, since I had some information around those FIFA rankings, um, I thought it might also be interesting to understand a little bit more about how the United States has done, has performed against more highly ranked teams as opposed to lower ranked teams. Or has the United States been succeeding primarily against teams in its own region, uh, the CONCACAF? In other words, has the United States been, been playing better against more familiar teams like those in the Caribbean or in North America relative to you know, countries around the world, like those in Africa or Asia or Europe or South America, uh, or even Australia and Oceania. So, you know, those are some things that were available in the data that could help me kind of flesh out my story. And so some of the views that I focused on, you know, were I thought it was interesting to call out the fact that, um, you know, and I'll be honest, I can't even say that I was aware of this. The United States was actually absent from the World Cup for years. Uh, the highest that it looked like the, the United States finished in the World Cup was, uh, you know, sometime prior to World War II, I believe, when they actually made it to the top three. But from 1950, the United States didn't participate uh, in the World Cup for 40 years. So that kind of gave me a, you know, very recent uh, group of, um, you know, World Cup performances to sort of look at and determine that, you know, overall, the United States has honestly struggled to find wins uh, in the World Cup. You know, you can see that our, our win rate over time has, you know, really just progressed to about 19 to 20%. So, you know, that's not terribly promising, even though it does look to be trending better. You know, the United States is still struggling to put together a lot of wins in the World Cup. And so I highlighted a few things here, um, you know, just by adding, um, you know, uh, x-axis constant lines to this bar chart, first calling out that 1950 was the United States' last World Cup for 40 years. And in the modern era, you know, we, we did make it to the quarterfinals in 2002, but we didn't even qualify uh, for the World Cup in 2018. So, you know, we've got about seven World Cups under our belt in the modern era, but we have consistently struggled to put up uh, wins. Uh, something else that I thought was interesting as I looked into more of the U.S. data that was provided is that while the U.S. doesn't win a lot of games, you know, we, we do come up with a lot of draws in the World Cup. And so I thought it was interesting to maybe call out, you know, that, you know, even though the United States doesn't put up a lot of wins, we also don't lose a, you know, terrible amount of time. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll continue to elaborate on this a little bit more uh, later on. Another area that I thought was interesting to call out was to look at the United States' performance in the last decade and kind of figure out, you know, which parts of the world uh, the United States uh, tends to succeed a little bit more. And so I put together a, um, uh, a line chart that just compares the United States' uh, winning percentage over the past decade against teams from different region, ob regions. Obviously, the United States plays teams from North America and C the Caribbean more than other areas. I know that the Caribbean is not a continent, obviously, but it did seem like a logical uh, group of countries to call out separately from, for example, the countries like Canada, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala that, that make up the rest of the North American field. And so you can see that, you know, the United States definitely seems to be a lot more comfortable to, uh, against teams that it um, plays more regularly and against teams that are kind of in its own backyard. So, you know, obviously the United States uh, look, looking, you know, fairly world class against teams from the Caribbean and North America. But, you know, when we look at the, at the historic powerhouses in the World Cup, a lot of those teams come from obviously Europe and South America. And that's where, you know, if you're looking especially at the last, you know, uh, four to six years. Uh, the United States has definitely struggled against Europe and has historically always, uh, you know, struggled against uh, more against teams from South America on the rare occasion that we play teams like 
Brazil or Uruguay or Argentina, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of promise promise there. Uh, you know, while I wish that I could have uh, gotten into, you know, more of the uh, player dynamics or game dynamics to try to understand, you know, maybe what it is about South American styles of soccer or European teams to sort of understand maybe more about why the United States struggles against these teams. Since we don't have that data, I'm just going to assume that it's uh, partly driven by the fact that obviously these countries are um, you know, kind of stalwarts when it comes to uh, succeeding in international competition. Um, but also, you know, it's probably just a, a maybe a, more of a lack of familiarity because uh, I also uh, learned from the data that the United States just does not play these teams as often as it plays uh, teams from its own region in like World Cup qualifiers, for example. And so I did call out, though, that, um, you know, obviously in the last 10 years uh, in uh, tournaments like the CONCACAF tournament or the Gold Cup, the United States has enjoyed a lot more success and has seemed to win much more comfortably. Um, and even in international friendlies in the past decade, outside of the World Cup, the United States does seem a lot more comfortable and still doesn't really put up a whole lot of losses. The next section of visuals that I, that I focused on was uh, trying to understand more about the United States' chances to get out of its group. Uh, as a U.S. soccer fan, my expectations are fairly realistic. I was not really expecting the United States to win in Qatar 2022, but honestly, as a fan, going in, I did think that their group selection was pretty strong, and I hoped that the United States had a pretty strong chance of uh, advancing from their group. And so, really, I just put together a couple of uh, visuals really focusing on the teams that qualified for Qatar 2022. And that, then I put together some uh, visuals sort of focusing on the uh, winning percentages and goal differential for all the teams that qualified for Qatar 2022 over the past four years so that I could call out specifically how the United States men's national team has done relative to the teams in its group like England, Iran, and Wales. And so, you know, you can see by this logic that it does look like, you know, the United States uh, and England are, you know, neck and neck uh, in terms of just raw winning percentage and goal differential. Obviously, a qualifier uh, to this visual would be that England was probably playing much more difficult teams than the United States since England, you know, is in, in Europe and probably facing European opponents much more regularly. Whereas, you know, I, I would understand based on the conclusions that I reached up here in this visual that the United States' uh, winning percentage and goal differential are probably being padded somewhat um, by uh, its success in the Caribbean and North America. But it still at least puts together a reasonable picture that the United States does did have a good chance of advancing uh, out of the group stage, since you can see that Wales, of the teams that qualified for Qatar 2022, actually has one of the most unfavorable goal differentials and lowest winning percentages uh, in the entire tournament, and Iran was kind of hovering around the middle of the pack. So overall, I was very optimistic that the United States uh, would advance from their group stage, and even though uh, my predictions on which games they would win and draw ended up not being accurate, um, it, it still uh, did come true, and the United States was able to uh, advance from the group stage in this tournament until they lost to the Netherlands just about uh, an hour and a half ago. And so I also uh, you know, wanted to make sure that I just implemented some additional call-outs about you know, the fact that obviously the United States does continue to feel most competent against uh, teams from North America as opposed to teams from Asia, Africa, South America. And then I thought that it also made sense to use this section in sort of, uh, you know, comparing the United States against the field of Qatar 2022 teams to understanding who they were likely to face um, after the group stage in the round of 16 and possibly even in the quarterfinals. And although looking at this, I actually ended up being wrong on a few of these entries. For example, Mexico and Denmark actually did not uh, advance from their groups. I still felt very confident, confident that the United States was going to face either Senegal or the Netherlands uh, in the next round. And you can see that, you know, my, uh, uh, my prediction here uh, relative to how the United States was going to succeed based on, you know, winning percentage, goal differential, um, you know, 
how many games uh, the United States has actually played against other teams that cover 2022 in the past four years relative uh, to uh, some of these other teams it ended up being somewhat uh, accurate. You know, it looks like a the Netherlands was uh, the most one of the most successful teams uh, that I predicted would would the United States could possibly uh, battle in the round of 16, and of course they ended up uh, that ended up being the case, and they ended up uh, losing I, I believe three one just a little while ago, uh, and then I also predicted that you know France and Argentina would also probably. Uh, you know, be among the teams that the United States could face down the road if they advanced um, from the group stage. And of course, that also uh, came, came into play. The Argentina, I believe, is getting ready to kick off here in just a few minutes and France plays later on. Uh, but you can see that, you know, relative to the teams that I expected the United States to face, they were right in the middle of the pack. So again, not a whole lot of confidence there uh, that the United States was going to survive for, for very long after advancing uh, from the group stage. And then in the final section, I wanted to just design some visuals focusing on uh, trying to get at the, the specific group of players that were going to be going to Qatar 2022 representing the United States. So I, I, I literally just took a rolling two year time frame to sort of understand more about this particular squad, or at least, you know, uh, players that had had a lot of international exposure for the United States recently to sort of understand, you know, is the United States team that is entering Qatar 2022, uh, you know, are, are they at the top of their game right now or are they maybe bobbling a little bit? And, you know, all we have to do is go back two years to see that the United States was actually, you know, winning pretty consistently. And uh, that has defi definitely started to trail off in the past year. So roughly from, you know, summer uh, 2021 leading into the tournament, you know, you can see a steady uh, decline in the United States' win, win rate, driven primarily by a return to draws and also a few losses against, you know, uh, uh, some teams that ended up actually being quite strong. I think one of these represents a loss to Japan, who has so far been uh, extraordinarily good in, uh, in this World Cup. And then I also uh, wanted to do some analysis comparing, you know, what, uh, how often does the United States win based on how many goals it scores and how many its opponents score. And, you know, obviously the United States' chances based on data from the last five years are pretty good at winning when it is able to hold its opponents scoreless. Uh, but we can see how much uh, the United States' uh, winning percentage drops when the, when the uh, team that it's playing against is able to score, you know, simply one goal. And this is because the more I looked at this data, the more I was able to determine that the United States just is not an extremely uh, high scoring uh, team or an offensive powerhouse by any means. The, the United States relies very, very heavily on its on its defense, which is honestly pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, so I you know, was able to kind of determine from the data that in order for the United States to be successful in cutter, it was really going to have to start generating goals on a level that we have not seen. Uh, you know, from the United States in recent years and something that was also, you know, sort of validated by their performance uh, just a little while ago against the Netherlands, where once they fell down by a goal, they were just unable to, uh, you know, claw their way back uh, in a reasonable manner. And the harder they tried, the more goals the Netherlands was actually able to uh, put up. And you, as you know, determined here, once the Netherlands got to three goals, I figured that they were pretty well locked in. Uh, the United States has not been very, very successful at winning uh, games where their opponent has scored more than one goal. Uh, and the United States has got to put up, you know, quite a few goals to see a substantial increase in its ability to uh, win games very, very consistently. And so those were most of the visuals that I came up with to sort of pad out my story. The next thing that I wanted to make sure that I did was, you know, come up with a as patriotic or United States uh, themed a design as I could. And so for this part, I'm actually going to go ahead and hop over to PowerPoint and kind of walk through uh, what I was able to create uh, for my design. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my selection pane and I'm just going to kind of walk you through the steps that I took. Basically how to tie together the different visuals that I created in Power BI and tell a story around my predictions for the United States in the Qatar 2022 World Cup. Obviously, something else that I wanted to make sure that I did, um, you know, was really just have fun with this. Uh, the thing that I love about uh, challenges 
um, like what Maven Analytics has presented here is it's the ability to test out some design ideas and maybe you know try try some tricks um, and ideas that you maybe wouldn't necessarily use in your uh, in your day job. And, um, and really just try to come up with something that's bold and vibrant that's, you know, going to get hopefully get people's attention on social media. And so, you know, the first thing that I started out with was I just wanted to think about how much space I was really going to use for the data. And so I created just kind of a border that, uh, you know, poses the question or the theme of my entire report. And that is, is 2022 the year for U.S. men's national team soccer? Uh, and then, of course, I wanted to add, you know, sort of a shout out to Maven for their World Cup challenge and, you know, maybe add some additional elements like Cutter 2022. And then if you scroll down here, you can see, the, you know, I've got gradients in my background, gradients in my outline, you know, trying to strike that uh, perfect amount of balance uh, that I can. And if you're curious about the stars over here on the left, those were a last minute addition, but you had better uh, be sure that there are 50 stars there. Don't worry, I did count. So the other thing that I decided that I really wanted to do, because you know I'm, I would consider myself a fairly large uh, soccer and/or football fan, um, but I'm also not just a U.S. men's national team soccer fan. I there are a ton of teams in this World Cup that I that I root for, and so I also wanted to make sure that I added a section, you know, just kind of caught spotlighting some of my other favorite teams. I obviously poked some uh, a little bit of fun at uh, some of these teams uh, just to kind of keep things light. Uh, you know, I would say that it, like in the case of France and Belgium, the harder that I made fun of your uh, country's team, the more jealous I am of your uh, football program. Um, so if you scroll through here, you know, there are just some of the other teams, mostly ones that I'm actually rooting for pretty heavily, uh, such as South Korea, Croatia and Japan. And, you know, just, just some funny comments to kind of uh, make the report a little bit more engaging. Obviously, things that I would never put into a uh, Power BI report in my day job, but just something in the interest of uh, competition to just keep things a little light. Uh, the next thing that I did, obviously, was I did add a footer to the bottom of my report, just something to kind of, you know, place my signature on everything. See if I can scroll down here without accidentally popping to the other page. There we go, just kind of letting you know that I developed this tool in Power BI. Shout out to my LinkedIn and a sweat out, uh, shout out to my Sweatpants BI YouTube channel where you're probably watching this. And then I started just literally um, staging three different sections to help flesh out my story based on the visuals that I created here in Power BI. So in the first section that I created, you know, again, what I was really trying to do was create some visuals that evaluated the United States men's national team's success on the world stage. In other words, you know, how has the United States performed in recent FIFA World Cup appearances? That would be 2006, 2010, and 2014, since it failed to qualify for the 2018 World Cup. And also, how has the United States uh, performed outside of the World Cup in the past 10 years? Again, I didn't want to go too far back in time because, you know, 10 years ago, uh, I doubt that many of the players that are on the Cutter 2022 uh, U.S. soccer team were even playing uh, for the U.S. team uh, that long ago. But just trying to kind of get an idea of maybe what are some things from the data that we could look at uh, in terms of raw winning percentage, you know, the number of titles won, um, the, the overall goal differential, you know, whether or not we're able to successfully outscore our opponents uh, and, and what have you. In the next section, I focused specifically on the United States' chances against teams who made Cutter 2022, with a section specifically focusing on the U.S.'s chances to advance from the group stage. If you remember, I had a uh, donut or a, a scatter plot, you know, kind of evaluating uh, win rate versus goal differential for all of the Cutter 2022 teams, with the U.S., England, Iran, and Wales uh, spotlighted. Obviously, for any kind of World Cup tournament, data can only go so far. You know, you never know uh, what else is going to happen on the pitch. You never know which uh, versions of teams are going to show up on game day. So there's not a whole lot of data in my actual predictions here. Just my gut feeling. You know, I did predict that the United States was going to beat Wales 1-0. That almost happened, but unfortunately, uh, Wales is able to tie that game up. 
Uh, I predicted an England uh, victory um, and was pleasantly surprised that that ended up being a 0-0 draw, but the United States was still ultimately able to defeat Iran 1-0 and advance from the group stage. So even though I got the details of, of the uh, matches wrong, I did predict that one win and a tie would be enough to advance them. And the United States did manage to advance from the group stage with a win and two ties. And then in the next section, I wanted to spend some time, you know, sort of uh, trying to evaluate what might happen if the United States did successfully advance from the group stage. You know, I predicted that if they were to win their group and play against Senegal, that would probably be a more favorable result than if they uh, if they came in second and had to face the Netherlands. Again, that part ended up being uh, unfortunately more accurate than I wish it had been. And then I predicted a hyper hypothetical quarterfinal quarterfinal competition against either France or Argentina, where I also, uh, despite, you know, cheering for the United States, was probably not very optimistic about the U.S.'s chances against either of these extremely strong teams. And then in the final section, I just took, you know, a little bit of real estate to sort of look at how the United States has been performing in the, in the past couple of years leading up to uh, Qatar 2022. And you can see that in there, you know, uh, in the last couple of years, if you'll remember the visuals that I had put together, the United States was actually performing pretty well during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, but its winning rate, unfortunately, has been in steady decline, driven primarily by uh, draws and obviously by uh, a not insignificant number of losses. Uh, going into the United States, going into the United States' uh, Qatar World Cup, uh, they they had a draw against Saudi Arabia, which ended up, you know, maybe not being the worst thing in the world. Saudi Arabia actually has a pretty had a pretty good team and a pretty good showing in this World Cup. They lost to Japan, who is uh, proving that they are in top form right now. And they also had a draw to El Salvador, which is a team that they've actually uh, managed to defeat pretty consistently uh, for the better part of the 21st century. Uh, and so I also, you know, tried to highlight that. You know, uh, regardless of the United States' recent performance issues, uh, their defense was probably strong enough, but their offense was just going to have to generate a lot more goals if they hope to advance uh, be much farther than the group stage in the World Cup. As I predicted, the United States was not a team that was going to post uh, any or, you know, or many or possibly any at all two or three goal performances in Qatar, which unfortunately also ended up being the case. I uh, don't think the United States was able to score more than one goal in a single performance, but, you know, that's just kind of the way it goes. So once I had uh, built my border and, you know, kind of had the, uh, the fundamentals of my uh, layout pretty well nailed down, I wanted to make sure that anybody reading this report at least had something to sort of uh, walk away with as an overall assessment of each section. So I also created a section, a um, uh, something to just uh, we'll we'll call them grades, and it looks like they're appearing over here. But there we go. Uh, so the grades are just kind of my overall evaluation for each section. So if I'm looking at the United States's overall performance. Uh, in uh, recent World Cups and on the international stage, you know, I wasn't about to try to come up with a probability or percentage based on this data. There are just too many uh, data points that I didn't feel I had. So I ultimately just kind of gave uh, each of these sections my own personal grade. Uh, you know, for uh, the first section, their international performance, I, I rated them a C, you know, kind of middling, especially in uh, World Cup performance. The United States just historically has not really proven themselves. Um, you know, they've done a little bit better um, in, in their own region and in other international competition. But, you know, I, I flirted with whether or not to give them a C minus. I ultimately just settled on a C. You know, I give them a very fair rating. As already mentioned multiple times, I felt pretty strong about their group draw, knowing that England was going to be easily uh, their most formidable opponent and knowing that Wales was not in particularly great shape. And Iran was honestly going to be kind of a toss up. Iran had a very, very strong uh, team coming into the World Cup. Um, and held their own against every uh, every team that they competed against, the United States including included. So I really just was kind of hoping that the United States would be able to pull off the win against either Wales or Iran and tie the other in order to advance. So again, I felt very, very optimistic about their group draw. Fortunately, that ended up being, you know, accurate. 
And then, I, of course, I felt a lot less confident about the uh, round of 16 and even less confident about the quarterfinals should they have made it that far. But nevertheless, since I felt really, really strong about their upfront chances in Cutter 2022, I did give them a B+. As far as their recent 24-month uh, performance, you know, obviously uh, I, I was a little dismayed to see that their win rate was dropping, you know, pretty steadily over the past uh, 12 to 18 months. But, you know, even though they had racked up some losses, uh, including New Japan, those losses were against very, very good teams. And a lot of their losses were against teams that actually qualified for Cutter 2022. So even though, uh, you know, U.S. media might have made some of those losses out to sound somewhat uh, uh, dire, I, I wasn't quite as pessimistic. So I did, uh, you know, definitely think that, uh, you know, predict that the United States was going to have some troubles on offense since it wasn't a particularly high scoring team. But I thought the United States' defense was in pretty good form. Uh, and I just kind of hoped for the best on offense. But even though, uh, again, things were looking fairly average for the U.S. relative to the field, I still assigned them a C plus grade uh, somewhat optimistically. And then the last thing that I made sure to add to my report was just an overall verdict. And uh, I've already been proven right on this as well, but the United States, I predicted, was very, very regrettably highly unlikely to win the 2022 World Cup, even though literally nothing in the world would have made me happier than to be proven wrong. I still just, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think it's going to probably be a European or South American team that is going to take home the trophy this year. I uh, am definitely going to be cheering for South Korea, Japan, and Croatia for the remainder of this tournament. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, I would personally love to see the Netherlands uh, go all the way this year. But, uh, you know, one of the great things about the World Cup is even though the U.S. has been eliminated, there's still tons of great teams that I'm going to be happy to cheer for throughout the remainder of the tournament. And we'll just we'll just see what happens. But at any rate, uh, thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope that you uh, enjoyed getting to actually uh, see sort of my uh, process behind designing my uh, Maven World Cup Challenge entry. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my canvas background and grab the actual image that I created in PowerPoint and kind of throw that back into the background of my Power BI report to sort of tie everything together. So this is how I got there. Uh, basically just built my entire layout in PowerPoint so that all of my uh, Power BI data visuals, all of my cards, bar charts, line charts, donut charts, etc., are just kind of overlaid on top of everything, you know, with descriptive text sort of explaining why I'm presenting those specific visuals. You know, definitely uh, pretty happy with how things came out. There's no question that it's a little bit busy, but that's largely driven by all of the text that I put in there because I had a lot to say on this topic. I, I love soccer. I love the World Cup. Um, wish that it came more often, but, you know, uh, them, them's the breaks. Uh, the fact that the World Cup's only every four years is part of what makes it special. I will definitely, definitely be hoping big time that my household's uh, favorite team, Bosnia and Herzegovina, makes it to the next World Cup, uh, even though it's going to be quite the challenge since they are in a very, very tough qualifying region. But I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Um, if you are interested in uh, me sharing this file, I'm happy to do so. Just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, once the Maven challenge is over, I will not be sharing it, um, you know, for better or worse until the competition's done. But after the first of the year or after this competition wraps up, I would love to send you this BBIX file. So thanks, everybody. I can't wait to uh, present my next uh, Power BI walkthrough on whatever uh, exciting challenge Maven Analytics or Enterprise DNA or any of the other um, companies out there that do these sort of competitions end up hosting next. I had a blast with it. If you entered the contest, Best of luck to you. I hope you're having fun with it as well. And if your team is still in the hunt at uh, Cutter 2022, I hope they pull it off. Unless you're a unless you're a supporter of France, then I'm probably going to be pulling against you if I'm honest. But France is going to be extremely tough to beat. So good luck to everybody out there. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time on Sweatpants BI.